This is Movers and Shakers, where we interview the upcoming generation of make it happen multifamily investors to share their story. Welcome to the Movers and Shakers podcast. My name is Gino Barbaro, the co founder of Jake and Gino, multifamily investor, educator, father, mentor, and I am joined by my co host, my brosif, Joshua Ryan Rusin, the community director of Jake and Gino. Josh, how are you doing today, bro? Gino, doing well, man. You know, super excited. I was just thinking this morning about our annual live event, Multifamily Mastery Live, and just the caliber of guests and attendees that we're going to be having at that event. Guys like Eric Thomas, the top motivational speaker in the world. Cole Hatter, who just crushes it in business and life and real estate. Gino, how are you? Josh, I'm doing good. It's a little raining today, to be honest with you. My level of energy is a little low, but once I saw the guest we had on today and spoke a little bit about his story and found out that you know he found us through one of these live events last year. His, his brother's been part of the platform for a couple of years. I want to dive into limiting beliefs a little bit on this show because I think limiting beliefs hold us back. And I think our guests found that, you know what? I can do it. I just got to surround myself with the right people. I have to have the right mentors and I have to take action. I think his story is going to be fantastic for us. Um, Having a great day. How about you, bro? Love it, man. So actually, like you talked about, our, our guest today, Jacob Anderson. Uh, he's actually from Cleveland, Tennessee. So he's at the hometown state over here in Tennessee and attended business classes at Lee University. Now, after college, he became a full-time health and life insurance agent and later purchased Green Tree Financial. Since then, he and his firm have been a top producer with several Fortune 500 companies. Now, Jacob started his real estate career in 2005 after an employee of his needed to sell two duplexes. Before discovering the power of multifamily, Jacob built his portfolio to 30 doors. Now, after finding Jake and Gino actually at Multifamily Mastery Live last year, he went on to scale his portfolio and has since purchased a 57-unit apartment complex. Wow. Welcome to the show, Jacob. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. So let's dive into this, Jacob. I mean, you, you decided to go to college. You know, I, I want to hear kind of why you decided to go into life insurance and then really creating that successful business, why real estate came into the picture, and even more so, why you decided to scale up with it. Well, um, I kind of had a little bit of an inside track in the insurance field because our dad had been in that for years. And of course, I never wanted to get into insurance because that was dad's thing. But when I started seeing the power of passive income through insurance where you do the work today and then if you do it correctly, you can benefit from it for years because of the residual uh, renewal income. Uh, it kind of attracted, attracted me. I was a you know, young college guy and saw what I could make. So did that for a few years. And then uh, uh, that's kind of what attracted me to real estate, uh, rental uh, income, because of the tax advantages, obviously, of rental income and its passive nature where, I mean, you still have some active uh, duties involved in it, but it's just like insurance where, you know, you can continue to benefit for years. And really, it's better than insurance in some ways, because eventually your clients, you know, they move or pass away or what have you. But uh, real estate's, uh, you know, it's it's depreciating asset, but it's, it's still going to be there. I mean, these properties aren't going anywhere. So, so when you first started out, you bought a couple of duplexes and you bought single family homes. Uh, what attracted you to multifamily? Well, um, multi, I didn't, I didn't do multifamily for several years, uh, mainly because uh, we were purchasing distressed properties, bank foreclosures, uh, did a lot of sweat equity ourselves in the beginning. My wife and I would do a lot of the painting and boy, that tested our marital, uh, <laughs> our marriage quite a bit, just working together. It was a good building process for us, but you know, you can, it, it takes as much resources as we've discovered to do one house as it does to do a, a 57 unit property. Can you say that again? That's really important for everybody to hear what you just said, because I totally and hundred percent agree with what you just said. Well, we've discovered that it, that it takes as much time, energy and, and, and resources to do one property, which is going to yield one rent than it does to take down a 57 unit property. Uh, and it was funny because we bought a house right about the same time that we bought the 57 unit and I was still struggling with the house, getting stuff done to it, fixing stuff we didn't know about. And the 57 unit was already occupied and, and we had very little issue with it at all. I told my wife, so we've been doing this wrong for the last 15 years. Uh, you know, we spent so much time on one unit and, and, and it was a good asset. Don't get me wrong, but we, I mean, to do 57 units, I mean, it's just incredible. Everything was just so much easier. The banks were way more negotiable on the terms. Now, naturally, it was a bigger, uh, a bigger deal for them. Yeah, it was just a all around, just a great, 
and there's so many more benefits derived from multi-unit. Uh, you know, the utility uh, contract that you, we put in place, uh, which is not, a, that wasn't a whole lot. I mean, it was like 50, I think $5,700 uh, for signing the contract with Spectrum. But just little stuff like that, the cost segregation was tremendous. Um, we, we had an offer to, to sell the contract from another investor while we were still in escrow. Uh, and we would have netted about 200,000 gross, but just the cost segregation alone that we're doing right now is worth uh, that much or more to us in terms of tax savings. When we have never even thought about that, didn't even know about cost segregation until we got into it. Oh, where'd you find, where'd you find that about cost segregation? How'd you learn about that? Uh, I actually found out about it through your platform, Gino. <laughs> so we, oh. we got introduced to uh, a boomer uh, at one of uh, your, your, uh, but your multi-unit mastery event. See, guys, everybody, this is important because what you don't know, you don't know. So if Jacob had not surrounded himself with his brother Abraham and not surrounded himself with Jake and Gino, he would have thought he made a great payday. $200,000 is a lot of money. But the difference between being truly successful and being wealthy is Jacob was looking at a transaction. He was looking to make 200000 of which he'd probably have to pay 30 to 40% to the government. So what is he left with? He's left with $140,000, $130,000 net, let's say. Great payday still. But transactions pay the bills. Equity creates wealth. And what Jacob did was... Let me turn it around. Let me own this 57 units. Let me take the depreciation on it. Let me keep the income that's coming from this. Let me wipe off some of the income coming from my current job. I've got a home run. I've got a depreciating asset that's going to appreciate in value going forward. And I have cash flow. Complete mind shift taking over. And that's why people are super, become super wealthy because they're thinking for the long term. It's not going to be a, a one month or two month process. It's going to take Jacob six, seven, eight months to stabilize the property, to get his bearings down, to have his wife do the management. And there's more work involved. But I think that work on the front end is going to lead to so much more value on the back end. I mean, did I summarize it pretty good or would you like to add anything to that, Jacob? No, no, that's perfect. Um, no, that's exactly right. Uh, as you peel the layers off one at a time, it just makes so much more sense to do the multi-unit. I mean, it just is, even if you have to, uh, even if you have to bring on partners, I mean, it's just the way to go. We were fortunate that it stressed us a little bit, but we were able to do this without partners. But, uh, but I think I can see the benefit of that if you have to do that. So Jacob, what were you doing wrong? I mean, you said I was doing everything wrong for 15 years. Can you pinpoint what you were doing wrong? Was it your mindset? Was it your, your strategy? Was it your limiting beliefs? What was, what was going wrong for those 15 years of doing those things? Well, and, and, and I don't, it wasn't anything wrong per se. I mean, mm -hmm. our, the values of the properties have went up tremendously since we purchased them. And, and they've been, the income has, has been there. I mean, they were all good investments. Mm -hmm. But I think looking back, we would have been better off focusing on a few less deals and better deals, larger deals versus, you know, a house every three or four months. We've been better off doing one large multi-unit a year even uh, because you have so much control over the value of that asset, as you know, the you know, house. I mean, you only can do so much. I mean, the comps are, you're limited by your comps. You're limited, always limited by your comps. But with the multi-unit, you have so much more control. And you can leverage so much better, you know, with 50 units. I mean, how long would it take us to do 50 houses? We haven't ever done 50 houses still. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, it took us 15 years to get 30. So uh, you, time is the biggest asset we all have, as you would agree. Mm -hmm. and, and that is where I think multi-unit is just so valuable because it allows you to, to leverage your time so much better. So I, I misspoke. I should never say he made a mistake or he did something wrong in his past because what you know is what you know at that time. So it's not a mistake because it's led him to multifamily, right? I mean, there's always, a, a, there's nothing wrong with the strategy. There's always sometimes better strategies or, or thinking bigger. So when somebody gets into residential or single family homes, they're not thinking big enough. And we all limit ourselves by saying, Jake and Gino can do it, but Jake and Gino started out with a 25 unit property also and thinking that, you know what, I can't do that. And that's what's holding us back. And, and you know, I think people, if they take a step back and they listen to these podcasts and go, well, Jacob's just an insurance salesman who owns a business who never did multifamily. If Jacob can do it, let me see what he did. Jacob, how did you find this deal? What was appealing to this deal that you, that you uh, took down? Well, it was, it was listed uh, by actually a realtor and I just happened to, uh, I've got realtor.com uh, set to where I get auto emails when properties are listed that meet, you know, our criteria. And so it was actually a listed deal. Uh, but we were quick. I called my broker, who's a, a friend of mine, and said, hey, we got to get and just look at this. This is a little bigger than I was looking for. <laughs> but I said, well, let's, let's take a look at it. So we went over. 
uh, looked through, you know, just, just looked through a couple of the units, uh, made an offer quickly, uh, and they accepted it, which I was surprised they didn't counter. But my broker was instrumental in that. He said, at that point, they already had a couple of other people interested. And he said, look, this guy is, is serious. You know, he's already, he's got the financing to do it, you know. Uh, and so they were friends, the listing agent and him were. And they just took the offer. I think they were afraid to go back and forth too much. And the real, the, the, the seller was out, of, had moved out of state. He had uh, a lot of incentive to sell and it just worked out. So as a mom and pop seller then, as somebody who's motivated that you, you identified, um, what, was the, what was the offer price? And what, did you, what was your strike price and the offer price on the property? It was listed at one million nine nine four, and we offered one seven five zero, one million seven fifty. And they took one seven five zero, huh? Wow! Right. And they what? purchased that for two million back in 07, originally. So wow! Okay. I was I was surprised that, and it worked out uh, that they just took their offer, no counter, and I thought, man, this is we're getting a heck of a deal here. Wow! So um, when you saw the deal, where were the value adds? What did you like about the deal? Well, what we liked about it was the location of the property was right next to Cleveland State College, which is one of the fastest growing colleges in Tennessee. Uh, it was right off, right near Target, a main shopping center, right off the interstate. Uh, it was a great property. All the units were one level. Uh, it was all one story. Uh, it had plenty of parking. Uh, they all had washer and dryer hookups. The, the value adds were the rents were really under market. Some of those people didn't live in there for nine and 10 years, which we like, but... <clears throat> There was tremendous opportunity to increase value through uh, through you know raising the rent to to what they should be today. And anything on uh, ratio utility with it was the tenant were the tenants paying water bills? Are you able to bill that back? There, the, the owner was paying the water, and we're actually in the process of implementing rubs, which we haven't fully done yet. Uh, but we we are doing that because it's about a three thousand dollar a month water bill, which um, you know obviously that would increase the value of the property tremendously tremendously so everyone get their calculators out three thousand times twelve is thirty six thousand dollars you divide it by would you say it's a seven cap environment seven cap oh yeah, yeah seven cap so do thirty six thousand divided by 0. 0.07 and that's how much value you're going to increase by pushing off the uh the, that value onto the tenants and it's it's something sounds like something that it's already happening in the market so there's a couple of buzzwords in there for everybody um jake and gino students are always looking for value adds Washer dryer hookups are huge. If you have washer dryer hookups, that's an additional twenty to twenty five dollars. And tenants are looking for washer dryer hookups. So that's an amazing value add that if, if the landlord's not charging for that, that's something where you can obviously do. What about the expenses on the property? Were the expenses was the property being run well from an expense standpoint? I didn't think it was. Uh the, the management company was was really hitting them pretty hard. Uh, it was they were charging ten percent to manage mm -hmm. and they really weren't doing a whole whole lot. I mean, they had a rent box on the property where people would just pay the rent in the box, oh. and they mm -hmm. would just go and collect it out every month. Uh, it, the, the 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 management fee I thought was tremendous for what they were actually doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so we knew we could reduce that right away. I do have a property manager in place that I use, but it's the the fee is almost half of what these guys were charging. Uh, so that was that was a big difference. Uh, some guys run it themselves. I just couldn't do that with our insurance business. I just did not have the ability or time to. to I mean, I could do it. I just don't have the time to. But, uh, but that was a huge uh, value add. It was just getting that reduced. Uh, as far as other, what was the question again? What, what? Um, as far as other expenses, I just want to jump in here real quick and and well, you saw Jacob's growth. Five years ago, Jacob was changing toilets and painting and doing all the work. Now he doesn't have time to do minimum wage work, which is an amazing shift, right? If you can manage the manager and implement and put somebody in there, paying somebody 5% to do that work allows Jacob to make more money as insurance, allows him to save his marriage, right? Because he doesn't want to get divorced, right? I mean, you got to stay happily married because if you're buying multifamily and getting divorced, there's no, there's, no, uh, there's no reason to be doing that. And also you're able to continue to grow and underwrite more deals and look at more deals and control. It's a business that Jacob is running. So I think that mind shift is just shown in what his, what his um, actions are. So people can talk all they want, but the actions say it all. And the fact that he's actually got somebody doing the work, that's, that's really impressive. And it might be when Jacob hits 200 units, he says goodbye to his insurance and maybe he brings it in house and does a little multifaceted. That gives them the opportunity, but I think that's an awesome shift over there. I mean, as far as other expenses, I want you to really take a look at your um, your contract services, your garbage, your landscaping. Um, you guys don't have much snow plowing down there, but your repairs and maintenance, a lot of that stuff down there. Uh, as far as cutting expenses, were you able to cut any, any other expenses on the property? 
Uh, yes, the lawn care was a big one, a lot bigger than I actually had realized because, uh, you know, dealing with smaller properties, that would never, never really was a big issue. But mm -hmm. uh, this was on six acres and it had a lot of areas that uh, it was a costly, uh, costly thing. We had to get a lot of bids and we finally got it down to, uh, to a lot less than what they had been paying prior. That's awesome. 250 bucks. So. Wow, that's awesome. Um, everybody, let's just take a quick break to listen from our, to hear from our sponsors. Gino, I know a lot of our listeners are wanting to take their multifamily investing business to the next level. I know that you've been hard at work helping Jake and Gino students do just that using our framework. Can you explain to the listeners how they can get our help? Guys, we've been hard at work growing our community of like-minded investors and the results of our members has been nothing short of incredible. We're looking to grow this amazing group. What we're looking for is those who want to follow our proprietary framework that we've created. Buy right, manage right, and finance right. Leverage our connections, education, and mentorship as ways to take your business to the next level. So if you're interested in finding out more about how you can become a part of our amazing community, apply to work with us at jakeandgino.com forward slash apply. Josh, I want to just uh, follow up just with, with a couple more questions. Um, how did you finance this property? Uh, we, um, we actually used a community bank that we had used in the past. But uh, this time before we just entered into an agreement to move forward, I went ahead and checked with a couple of your lenders first, uh, just to, to keep them honest because mm -hmm. it was such a large deal and every little bit would make a difference on mm -hmm. this. <laughs> so we actually were able to get them to change a couple of their terms. They wanted to do a uh, shorter amortization and we got them to do, we ended up at a 20 year, but they just did a 15% down, which, which, uh, which helped. And then they also lowered their, um, their amortization, I mean, their uh, origination, we got it down to half a point. So, uh, so we ended up staying with the community bank. Our goal is to uh, refinance it to Fannie Mae after two years. But um, it, it was helpful to have that relationship though, because that was something that their selling broker wanted was a letter showing that we had already been pre-approved. And all I had to do was text her and say, hey, I need this letter. And boom, she sent it over immediately. Even before I knew we were going to use her it still helped having that relationship. So that would be something I would say is make sure you've got a relationship with a banker in place first. Cause I mean, that, that really, I think made the difference in her taking a serious right off the bat. And it's funny, we teach our students, you can get 15% down and we've done it multiple times. And here's proof of the pudding. When you go out and you start pitting one bank against the other, I mean, the 20 year AM, we've gotten those, we don't like those, but if I have to sacrifice a little bit of amortization, a little bit of cash flow to put 5% down less than a deal, I mean, that's saving me a lot of money and I don't have to go out and raise equity. I can come in with most of my money, not have to partner. So you have to weigh the options. And if your strategy is to refi after 18 months, you might get a year of interest only on this deal. So you might work that out. Out, and then after 18 months, you refi and go into Fannie, go into Fannie or Freddie product, which is the refi and roll strategy. And, you know, it looks like Jacob's going to be able to pull out the majority of his, of his um, money that he puts down. Um, I'm assuming that his net operating income is going to go up enough to cover the additional debt, but he's going to get a 30 year amortization. He's probably going to get three years of IO from this deal. So his mortgage payment is probably going to stay the same and it probably might take down a little bit because that extra 10 year am. So um, this is an ideal property to, to refine role. He identified the value adds on this. He's got a strategy in place and he's going to, he's going to work the strategy and it, it's exciting. Are you looking at other deals right now? Are you looking to expand right now? Or are you just worried focusing on this property? Right now we're just focusing on this one and I'm building a, uh, uh, we're building a 12,000 square foot office building. So uh, that's kind of taken a lot of our time, but once we get that completed, which should be hopefully by the middle of next year, we definitely are, are uh, going to be searching for more deals. And if another great deal came down the pipe, I would try to work something out, <laughs> but mm -hmm. we're not actively searching for anything right at this moment. Um, so but, the, but the, the apartment comp, the um, in 12,000 square foot building, is that going to house your insurance company? Yes. Yeah, it is. Uh, we have a building now that we own uh, that's just not quite large enough. Thankfully, we have been uh, able to, to have a lot of growth. And so we, we found a piece of property that we're building on. Uh, I didn't want to build. I'd rather purchase already built, but there's just nothing that fits, fits our needs. So we're having to go through that process. Josh, multifaceted, multifamily. He's going to be paying himself the mortgage and he's going to have a couple of tenants that help him pay the mortgage. It's an awesome strategy, everybody. Love it. And our cash flow, the way I've got it figured, should cover the, the note on, on both properties. <laughs> Which is awesome, dude. Great. That is awesome. 
Yeah, that's huge. All right, Jacob, I got a few short answer questions for you here. So what's your best advice for anyone trying to buy their first multifamily property? Well, my first, my, the first thing that I would do is get plugged into a live event, which sounds almost like a commercial, but I don't have any uh, incentive to say that. <laughs> so uh, that really turned it for me when I was able to go to a live event, meet people that are doing it. And then I came home and told my wife, I said, honey, these people are doing it. They're no better off than, no better than we are, you know, so we need to look at this more seriously. But I think going to that live event really split the switch for me. And I can, I'm I can, a multifamily mastery live, right? Yes. Exactly. And I can and, piggyback and, off of that because Jacob, um, Jacob's brother, uh, Abraham went to the 2017 first event and I think he brought his father and everyone. And, and I think they were a little skeptical, but then Abraham took his deal down. And then I think the next year he probably told Jacob, you've got to come. And I don't think Jacob would have come without his brother. Am I correct on that one? I probably would not have, uh, but, but yeah, he, he, he dragged me in and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> good little brother, Jay, Josh, you know what I'm saying? Good little brother. <laughs> yeah, love it. Uh, Jacob, what about your favorite book you've ever read and why? Uh, the make friends and influence people by Dale Carnegie. I know that's one a lot of people mention. Uh, it's helped me out through insurance, uh, uh, through my career. That's, that's been a book that, uh, I really like. the strangest secret by Earl Nightingale, another great book. Uh, the one most recently that I've been reading was The Atomic Habit by James Clear. Uh, powerful book that really uh, helps us look at, at what we do daily without even realizing it, or everything we do is a habit. And that, that has really uh, been an awesome book. Love it. I, How to Win Friends and Influence People is an, an annual read for me that it's definitely one of the most impactful books I've read. Uh, what about your best habit for success? My best habit for success? Um, Listen to your little brother. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> uh, my best habit, and I don't know that you'd call this a habit, but is just being conscious of what I'm just doing with my time. Uh, even when I'm at the office, it's amazing how time just gets away from me. And, and my best habit is, okay, what do I need to do right now? Uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the book, um, oh, I can't think of it now. The, uh, the, the one that highly effective awesome. people, yeah. you know, do, doing the things that are, are, that need to be done, but aren't urgent. So they don't become urgent later. Just kind of keeping a list of, okay, th these things I've got to do today. If I don't, I'm going to really have to do them tomorrow. And then it's going to be an urgent priority. So just, just keeping a priority list and just taking care of things without letting things get time get by. Cause it get, we're all busy. Time gets away from us and just kind of staying focused on tasks and not letting the distractions of the day kind of get in, in your way. has been a big help for me. Awesome. Uh, Gino, I mean, this was a really powerful show and, and there's a lot of golden nuggets in this one. Would, would you want to give the listeners kind of a, a recap of, of some of the takeaways from today? Um, there are a lot of things that we could mention. I think the first thing is just focus on and be clear on what you want with your, with your life, with your business. I don't think Jacob uh, wants to leave his insurance company right away. That might be an option. Don't have limiting beliefs. Don't think that just because everyone else is doing residential and buying one house at a time, that that's good for you. Uh, plug yourself into a community or into an environment where others are doing what you want to do and, and see what they're doing. And don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to go out and network because real estate is a networking uh, task. I mean, the fact that Jacob had a community banker lined up for his 57 unit, the fact that he had a broker that he leveraged to help him take this deal down, those things don't happen by accident. There's a lot of hard work. There's a lot of groundwork that Jacob had to lay down. And also, uh, you know, learning how to take the property over and learning how to manage right. Those are things that Jacob learned. So there's a lot of work that goes in on the front end. I think also thinking about having a big payday as opposed to delaying the instant gratification and, and working on it and trying to create a business out of multifamily is going to make Jacob super successful. And I get, I guess two years from now, he's going to have his 12,000 square foot building. He's going to have this 57 units and the 12,000 square foot building is another cost segregation. So he's going to be wiping off the taxes on that. So you can see into the near future, Jacob is probably going to have a small tax liability. So it's not what you make everybody. It's what you keep, which is amazing. So um, let's not, we can, dive into that for another story but i think ultimately know your why be clear on what your strategy is be conscious with your time get off of facebook get off of instagram and 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 reclaim your time and really strategize and really think of uh, multifamily as a business and all the different layers we didn't even talk about the six thousand dollar cable jacob just poo-pooed that 
Six thousand bucks for a lot of people is a lot of money. So, I mean, just for signing a contract that tenants already need, signing a laundry contract, making another thousand dollars a month on laundry, you can see the additional revenue streams that multifamily can provide for you and for your family. So, I commend Jacob for not having the limiting beliefs and saying, you know what, if he's doing it, I can do it. If Jake and Gina were doing it, I can do it. But there's a lot of steps that you need to take. Go back and listen to the podcast and listen to his story really clearly on why he became successful. Wow. Exactly. Thanks for summarizing that so well. Yeah, powerful wrap up there. Well, guys, I want to thank Jacob for being an amazing guest on the show and sharing his Movers and Shakers story. If you want to be the next Movers and Shakers guest, email me, josh at jakeandgino.com. Now, if you like the show, please leave us a review. And until next time, let's make it a Movers and Shakers week. See you guys then. Thanks, Jacob. Bye, Josh. Thanks a lot, guys.